So again, we're gonna do fifth grade natural environment. And again, my name is Debbie. And again, my background is forestry and wildlife management. And um, this is an interesting program for me because I see so much change here in the Fremont area. Now you kids may not notice it much depending on how long you guys have been here. Teachers, I know you guys probably have been here longer. Um, so it's, in, it's interesting to see the change. Some is good, some is bad. <laughs> so that's kind of what we're gonna talk about. So as you're wandering around the next few days and few weeks, kind of notice just what's going on around in your built environment. Look at the roads, look at the buildings, notice the trees, um, the sewer drains. So just kind of, you know, start noticing more, look a little closer at your urban environment that you have around you. All right, and again, there is a worksheet. If you have it, don't worry about it. If you don't have it, don't worry about it. Your teachers will get that to you. And that is for an owl pellet. And teachers, if you want to get some, um, send me an email at davidson at msnucleus.org, or we can go back to this one here, or just that msn at msnucleus.org, and we will respond back to you. Um, easiest thing is probably just, I'll be at Tule Ponds tomorrow morning, like nine to say 12. Um, if you've never had a chance, for teachers to go through there, then you could walk through there as you pick up your owl pellets. Okay, but I've just got a few that I could offer um, each class and then you can do it virtually as well. All right, so again, that's that website. If you need to contact us, if I don't have time to get to all the questions at the end, then that's also a good place um, to send us a note. All right, I think we will go ahead and get started. All right, so today again, we're talking about healthy environment. So that includes, again, basic requirements. We need clean air, clean water, right? And then what else? A clean place to live, right? So let's think of our food sources in our earth. So we need clean soil so that that can grow us good, clean food, all right? Now, we've got, as a built environment, as people come in and we build more houses, we have our cars, we adding, we're adding a lot of chemicals to the mix. Um, we're gonna notice what some of those chemicals are today that we need to start watching out for. Um, we get radiation coming off of stuff, all kinds of, all kinds of chemicals and things are happening. So we need to minimize some of those risks and those things that can pollute our environment. We wanna make sure we stay on top of it so that we don't get to a place where we can't recover anymore. All right, so again, trying to keep our healthy environment in mind. All right, now helping our local environment. If you think about it, this is again, a picture of Masonic Homes down there at Union City. And again, you can probably see it right when you're driving down Masonic, it's right there next to like Guy Emanuel. But again, we're looking at clean air, soil and water. Of course, you need the air to breathe so do other organisms, right? Um, we need our soil, again, to be healthy so that we get great growth and home for our other organisms as well. We need clean water, again, for us and other animals. And one thing that we are doing here at Masonic Home, if you remember from our last presentation was we've got a project there where we're taking the food waste and putting it in a big, thermophilic composter, a hot, hot composter, mixing it up with wood chips and horse manure. And that gives us a great compost to then put up on top of the hill. So on top of the hill, we mix in wood chips again for some airspace in the soil. Um, it helps hold all the moisture and all as well. So we're trying to put some healthy soil, revive that area, okay? Because it's been some pretty bad soil for a while. Once we get that done, then again, we can plant and get more trees. Now, how does your local environment change? You think, eh, you know, what's changing in your world? Eh, changes what you can get on Netflix, you know, changes um, sports, um, whether you have to wear your mask or not, you know, so we do have some changes going on, um, but a lot of times things happen around us and we do stuff without even thinking about the results, you know, like what's 
we just don't think about the results. It's not a big deal, right? Um, we also sometimes make changes and we don't monitor the results. Okay, like something, um, we had some changes at Tule Ponds where they changed the amount of water that they were giving us. All of a sudden, all of our fish didn't have a place to live. You know, we started to have a fish kill. So again, we have to monitor and stay on top of things. Um, somebody being all talk and no action. You guys know anybody like that? Talk and no action. Like your parents probably bug you all the time to clean your room. And you guys eventually do because you don't want to be in trouble. But again, talk and no action. So I'm going to show you today how you as a kid can be an advocate. You can take action. You can be a part of creating your healthy environment. And of course, our state, counties, and cities, they all play a part in this. They create a lot of the rules and whether or not they enforce those rules um, requirements um, is kind of up to them. Now, one thing that's unique, I think, in this area, because housing is so expensive, a lot of the people that work in our county and our city don't live necessarily in our city, right? They're driving in from other places. So that's why it's even more important if you are local that you speak up and have a voice. Um, so again, it's up to you to protect your world. All right, I'll show you some ways that you can watch out for it. Now, when the missionaries came back in the late 1700s, all right, this is kind of a funky picture, um, but when they came in, they brought horses and cattle. They were, they were not here yet. We just had our native Ohlone's here. Um, they also brought with them the food that those animals would need. So they brought their palms and the wheat. Well, when they planted all those things, they took over, they were invasive and they kicked out all of the native plants. Um, so that was a problem for a lot of then our native animals, right? Too much competition. They cut down all of the trees. They cut down the forest because they needed wood for construction. Um, what happens when you cut down the trees? Then you get a lot of erosion, right? The topsoil comes off. Um, they also dammed up the rivers. They wanted to control the way that the water flowed. So this was again, problems that started back in the 1700s. Not quite sure of what the results were gonna be. So again, this is what's happening when you cut the trees, again, without those roots and all to hold that topsoil and give it a little support, you end up with a lot of erosion and that topsoil erodes off. So a lot of our topsoil did end up in our valley where we're living now. Um, that's why years ago, this area of Union City and Fremont had big farms, uh, gladiolas, all kinds of fruit trees, great farms, because that fertile soil was down in the valley. All right, so after the missionaries was the rancho time. And this is a time period where again, cattle, huge cattle ranches were created. Um, they were used for trade and they again controlled the water. So if you look at this one picture, if it's hot, cause you know, once you get past the first row of hills then it gets hot back in there. If cattle are hot, they're gonna go back and they're gonna hang out down there in the river and they're gonna pee and poop in the river. Well, you're down the river getting your drinking water from the river. Kind of a problem? Yeah. So they dumped a bunch of garbage and all near the rivers, not really thinking of that it would be a big deal, you know, if it's just them doing it. Oh, they didn't realize there were a lot of thems doing it. <laughs> all right. So again, these industries left um, a critical mark on the environment. All right. We also had Calaveras. If you've ever been back in there, it's a canyon area. Um, it's called the Land of Skulls because our big cattles, when they were trying to um, process the cattle, slaughter the cattle for the fat hides and the meat, they wanted it away from everybody. Nobody wanted to see that. They didn't want to be around it. Um, so they took it back into the canyon and they hid all that so that most people couldn't see it, but it still caused a great deal of pollution and damage to the environment. Then we had the gold rush here in California. So then more settlers came. So if you look at that in the um, area increased in population, a thousand people grew to 25,000 people in one year. So if you went from just a small little town and all of a sudden all these people, where are you gonna put them? Where are they gonna live? Where are they getting the food? Where is the clean water? Okay, we didn't have the infrastructure we didn't have all those things in place. 
Okay, so again, the environment was overrun. And just the process of looking for gold was very detrimental to the environment. Look at the, the rocks and all here. So they would dig up everything and sluice it through the water, um, trying to find that bit of gold, but again, created um, just a mess <laughs> of the topsoil um, and the, the bed rocks. I mean, just a, just a mess. All right, so again, lots of cutting of trees, uncontrolled fishing and hunting. There was nobody really in charge. Um, and again, a lot of pollution and all created. So again, that infrastructure just wasn't here when everybody came, came in. Now, by the 1970s, um, this place was still, as you see in that lower picture, a lot of farmland here in Fremont Union City. So we still had a lot of farms. Most of the growth was kind of on the other side of the bay. Um, but it was starting to creep in, but you had all things like, like everybody had like a little airport, but you see, look at all this junk. Look at these, these cans, these oil cans. So those would have had either oil or paint, um, gas, just some kind of contaminants, but it's sitting right next to the bay. So if it's leaking, it's going to leak into the bay water, right? And people would just throw their trash out if they didn't need it anymore. Look at a car sitting in the middle of the bay. Okay. It's just... So they're making it somebody else's problem, okay? They didn't want to deal with it, not their problem. So they just kind of moved it on. So again, at the 1970s, raw sewage was going straight into the bay. Sewage is your pee and your poop, straight into the bay. <laughs> By 72, 1972, um, they finally began to understand the problems that this was causing and started to clean up the watershed. 1972. All right, so when I say watershed, this is a map of our watershed. You've got, um, let's see, Union City over here, and that big brick building you see is Masonic Homes. So we've got Alameda Creek, which is, of course, has been dammed and rearranged and moved. But when you see these, these blue lines, that's moving water. So it, whether it's rivers, um, tributary streams, but in all the time that people have been here, they've been rearranged quite a bit. All right, so again, that's Union City area. If you um, drop a piece of trash though, it's going to end up in the bay because the storm water is not processed. All right, let's see, this red zone. So this area is the Lake Laguna. And again, you see the tributaries that are coming in. Um, if you look further down, like right there by that yellow car, there's kind of a peachy tan color. All right, those are sewer lines that carry your pee and your poop. So all of those sewer lines, all those sewer lines go to Union City to be processed. All right. And then in the middle, of course, we have our Newark Fremont with Tule Ponds right up there at the top. But again, anywhere in this area, um, if you throw down trash, it's going to end up in the bay. All right, so when we talk about clean water, we're talking about water that involves the lakes, the rivers, the groundwater, water that's stuck underneath the rocks, and our storm water, all right? So our drinking water, um, I'll show you in a minute where it's coming from, and hopefully it gets delivered to you safely. And our sewage, where the poop and our pee goes, the storm water, again, goes directly into the bay. All right, so here's a quick story that gives you lots of content on how water works. Giving Water a Second Chance, written by Joyce Bluford, illustrated by Augustine Salgado, animated by Doris Rea and Hagos Tavolti. This is a story about how water changes and can be dirty and then get cleaned. Dippy, drippy drop sat on a rock in a nearby bay. Notice that water is in two forms on Earth, one as fresh water and the majority of it as marine water or salty water. Dippy Drippy Drop was thinking about his family and was sad. He began to dream about Beady Bead and Cloudy. He started to cry. One of his tears came alive. Dippy said, Beady Bee, 
I'll come back to share some water adventures with you. Oh, Beatty, said Dippy, it is always fun to go through the water cycle with you, as we have done over and over again. Notice um, Beatty and Dippy are going through precipitation, evaporation, condensation over and over again. Remember the first time we became water? Mother hydrogen and father oxygen gave birth to us in a volcano. We were just gas then and floated up into the sky and met cloudy. I have to explain this a little bit. The earth, which is about three and a half to four billion years old, um, did not have water. It was the miracle of volcanoes that what we called outgas, enough energy to bind hydrogen and oxygen together to give us water over time. It took about a billion years before there was even enough water to start thinking about why water was important to our Earth. We played on cloud, Cloudy's belly. Life was fun, but it became crowded with too many drops. We had to leave. Dippy became a snowflake and Beatty became rain. They met Wanda Wet, their cousin, who came down as hail. They all finally landed in rivers and were proud to become part of the Earth's water supply. A long time ago, a dinosaur drank Dippy. Dippy had a wild ride through the dinosaur, then sank through the rocks into groundwater and then into a stream. Want to explain this a little bit. Water recycles throughout billions of years. So a water droplet that might have been part of a dinosaur's um, wee-wee could have been cleaned and you could be drinking that today. Wanda Wet became part of a lake that was very muddy. She evaporated and met Cloudy. Then she fell back to earth as a clean raindrop. Just so you understand, when you get muddy or dirty, the only clean H2O comes, will evaporate into the sky. Dippy and Wander were clean naturally through the water cycle. People could now drink Dippy and Wander after they were cleaned by nature. Once Beatty got cleaned a different way, Beatty began to belonged to a dirty water gang. She was sent to a cleaning factory, which removed big clumps of dirt. Beatty needed a second cleaning before she was clean enough to use again. Although Beatty was cleaned by a factory, some of her family was cleaned by nature. Now all were clean and ready to be used. Recycled beady could be used to make flowers and vegetables grow. Recycled beady could also be found swimming in a toilet bowl or keeping the grass green at your local park. The water is clean and will not harm any living creatures. Dippy, Wanda, Beatty, and Cloudy were so happy they could be recycled over and over to help people animals and plants live on the planet Earth. The end of this story, but not of the water cycle, which goes on and on and on. Okay, I just wanted to show you that just to give you a background so that we're all kind of on the same page. A lot of people forget where water came from, but it was created by volcanoes. Hydrogen and oxygen fused deep within the earth under that heat and pressure and then outgassed as, as steam. So it took millions of years to create our water that we have. And again, it's just recycled um, over and over. And that is a limiting factor here in California. Y'all are squished up here against the bay because there's large regions that don't have access to water. Again, a limiting factor here. So where does your drinking water come from? So here in the Tri-City area, 40% of it comes from groundwater. Luckily in our watershed, we have access to that Niles cone, um, which is a very large aquifer. 40% of it we buy from Sacramento, from the Delta area. And then 20% we purchase also from Hetch Hetchy, from San Francisco, San Francisco um, PUC. 
So water, again, very expensive here. You don't want to waste it. Oakland, Berkeley, and Hayward, um, they have MUD, East Bay MUD, the Municipal uh, Utility District, and San Francisco has the Hetch Hetchy and PUC. So again, all depends on where you live, where you get your water. All right, I took a few clips from some of these areas because when I was a kid, that was one of the things we did as field trips where we were required to go to the dump to see where your trash went, to the water departments to see how your water was cleaned. Um, you know, there's certain field trips like that, but I don't think they do those anymore. So I just took a few of these clips just to show you bits and pieces of this. So this is on um, Mission Boulevard, as you're getting close to the highway near Fremont, you see a pretty front of a building, but you don't see what's actually behind it. But I want you to start noticing as you're driving around, see those big round structures, okay? Because these are spread out all over the place. All right, here we go. This facility, our water treatment plant number two, uses state-of-the-art technology to treat water from the Delta. As part of a multi-step process, ACWD, uses ozone to disinfect the water. We were one of the first agencies in the United States to use that method. All of these different sources of water and cutting edge technology increase flexibility, reliability, and save customers money. All right. So again, trying to save customers money. Again, it's a limited resource. So we do pay a lot for it. If you've ever, um, if you've never paid attention, ask your mom or dad how much your water bill is, or if it tells you how many liters or gallons that you use. Um, it's kind of interesting to see. All right, so, but know that if that water coming out of the tap um, at your sink or so is safe for you to drink, but it still has other chemicals that have been put in it. Usually our city water has a lot of fluoride that's needed for your teeth um, and a lot of chlorine, um, which goes into help cleaning it. But again, that's not gonna be safe for other organisms. Okay, so like if you have fish, you always have to wait, um, use different tablets to get that chlorine out because that fish cannot survive in that water. So again, what's clean to you may not be clean to a smaller organism. All right, so let me show you another quick. It's the defining principle of physics here on Earth. It affects nearly everything in the universe and is precisely 9.80665 meters per second squared at sea level. It's also how your poop gets from your toilet to the wastewater treatment plant. Hmm, have you ever thought about that? Where does your poop go? You flush the toilet, it goes down, but then where does it go? So if you're in an apartment complex, let's say you're on third floor, so it goes down, to like the first floor, but then where does it go? All right, all of around the system, our storm, our, all of our drains are using gravity to push everything um, to be processed around Union City. All right, so again, this Union Sanitary District, that's a big, huge building. Um, again, it goes through lots of different processes to be cleaned, but as this is the sewage removal for all of the Tri-City area. All right, so again, most of us don't really think about um, what's going on with the toilet and how water goes, even just down the drain when you're brushing your teeth, you know, where does all that stuff go? Um, and unfortunately, a lot of stuff goes down the toilet that shouldn't, like diapers, that'll clog up the drains, that'll mess up all, your whole apartment complex. Um, little kids drop toys, keys, things like that down. So there's a lot of stuff sometimes that gets dropped down those drains. And again, the only way to access this whole underneath world of clean water and sewage water um, is again, to usually tear up these roads to access. All right, so in the Tri-City area, our water, clean water gets back, filtered back into the San Francisco Bay. And then any of the waste ingredient is then added into compost. And Oakland and Hayward, water again to the San Francisco Bay. Any waste left over is again used in compost. San Francisco, water goes all the way out to the ocean and any waste again in compost. So here's a little more. We have to manage our waste because it stinks, it contains deadly bacteria, and it has dangerous chemicals that could affect the environment. You probably know that wastewater gets treated at a wastewater treatment plant, but let's take a look how it gets there. 
Sewer systems. Urban wastewater systems are needed in densely populated areas so you don't have to deal with your neighbor's sh waste. In ideal environments, sewer systems are completely gravity fed, meaning that the pipes slope downward from the source, your toilet, to the wastewater treatment plant. This is done because wastewater has a lot of solids in it. Make a lot of solids? Yeah. All right, let's keep going. In Fremont, Newark, and Union City, more than 800 miles of pipelines bring wastewater to Union Sanitary District's treatment plant. It's here that wastewater begins its real journey, where it's transformed into clean water for the environment, energy to run our plant, and biosolids for beneficial reuse. Okay, so there she's calling it biosolids for beneficial reuse. Again, it can be, your poop can end up as compost. <laughs> All right, so again, you see how many people though it gets, it takes to get that clean drop of water to your house. All right, um, lots of different engineers, uh, just tons of different jobs, computer people, um, just billing people, and just, I mean, just tons just to get you a clean glass of water. Okay, sometimes we take advantage of that. At Union Sanitary District's wastewater treatment plant, we treat 22 to 24 million gallons of water per day to create safe, clean water for on site reuse or release into the San Francisco Bay. All right, so again, that water is then released. Um, there's a big a pipe um, that goes out right by the San Mateo Bridge, I think is where that is released. So again, um, huge pipe system, it's a whole nother city just beneath us that makes all of everything work. All right, here's a blip on stormwater. Tyson's Lagoon is an important area to maintain the habitat that have come here for millennium. It provides nutrients, food, and a place to stay protected while they're on their journey from the north to the south, and then the south to the north back. All right, so this is the big area of water there is called Tyson's Lagoon. And the smaller ponds are three man-made ponds that again is used as a stormwater retention area. So Tule Ponds is a low point for about 700 acres. Also directly runs the Hayward Fault, runs right through there as well. So we know that there has been water there for at least 4,000 years because, and that fault line is where water can percolate up. Okay, so luckily that area has not been, um, has been able to keep water around it. But when we first took over Tule Ponds, um, it was just kind of being mowed. A lot of kids had their motorbikes and all there. Um, it's a lot of gravel. And over the last 20 years, we have replanted native plants there so that now we've got what you see there in the picture in the video. And um, these tulies that we've planted are actually part of the bioremediation where they actually clean the water. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So again, if you drop of some trash down, odds are it's gonna end up in Thule. From Thule, then it goes straight out to the bay. All right, we're gonna fly over Thule. And again, the tulies you see are the tall um, with the brown little seeds on top, right, right along the water's edge. So they are an aquatic plant. Again, we've planted lots of willows, buckeyes, um, lots of oaks, again, that are native to the area. And this area backs up to BART parking lot. And you see we have apartment complex and then larger houses on the other side. And there you can see up into the hills of Union City. So again, the Hayward Fault runs right through there. All right, here's a closer look at what's going on with these roots. Now we're gonna look at some of the Thule roots. Thule's are noted for its bioremediation. Within the roots, there is uh, lots of fungi that are growing. So art's kind of pulling it out. You see the roots are pretty extensive. And so we're going to take a look at this root as he clears it away. And you can see the roots right there. And those roots have fungi in it that help chelate or take out heavy metals like copper and lead 
Oh, and there's a little, is that a little worm there? Yep, little worm. Okay. All right, so again, these um, tulies are very important. This area, years and years ago, tons and tons of tulies. So our wetlands and our water areas were much, much larger. Um, we've lost probably 95% of the tulies in the area. So again, that's part of our restoration. All right, so something I wanted to show you is this chemical pollution, trying to figure out where this pollution can come from. And you may have seen this before, the periodic table. It's something that you'll use in high school and college. And hopefully you'll never be required to memorize it. It is simply a tool. <laughs> but what we will do is um, show you where some of these chemicals come from. All right, so I've got a list here. Again, chemical and physical pollution. I don't know if you can see my chart here. But if you look at the chart to the right, so you look at gasoline and you go across the top and it says CD. So you have to find CD on this periodic table and find out what it is. And I can tell you it's cadmium. And the CU is copper. And the PB is lead. The ZN is zinc. So those are all components that would be polluting from gasoline. So just as your cars, every time your car, you take your car out, all these things are ending up all over the road. So when it does rain, all these chemicals, then these heavy metals are being washed down the storm drains. Remember the storm water is not filtered. So that's why it has to go through something like tule ponds so that it is clean before it gets out to the bay. So teachers, we did not put this as a printout, but I don't know if you can screenshot or if you need us to um, send it to you, then we can. But you look down the list, gasoline, exhaust, motor oil, antifreeze, undercoating, brake linings, rubber. Again, these are all things, every time you drive a car, this is what's gonna wash off these heavy metals. So physical pollution, things like plastic. We get tons and tons of plastic bottles. And it doesn't matter what kind of plastic it is, it's going to end up breaking into smaller pieces. But that doesn't really help either because the smaller organisms, like the fish and the microorganisms, they're still going to try to eat the plastic. All right, so again, that's a problem. Sediment, we have a lot of sediment that comes through the loose dirt. If there's a construction zone a couple blocks away, they don't put up a silt fence and it rains, all that comes washing in. May not seem like a big deal to you, but if you're a smaller organism, that's enough to wipe out your whole environment. Um, Tule ponds used to be about 10 feet deep and now it's only about three feet deep. And it again has filled with sediment over the years. Again, we get lots of cigarette butts, um, it's better now that we don't have all the bags, you know, the plastic bags that we used to have. Um, but again, any kind of trash is going to end up there. And again, we've got to clean it. All right. So getting into our atmosphere, the part of the atmosphere that we're usually most concerned with is our troposphere. That's where the weather occurs. Okay, um, that's usually just what we pay attention to. We sometimes forget that we have all these other layers that are protecting us from lots of other radiation, um, the ozones, all these other things that are coming at us all the time. All right, so again, we wanna keep things as clear as we can. You guys, your air is much better now than it even was 10 years ago. There used to be kind of a brown haze and because you guys worked so hard on your rules and regulations, for your air quality, you, that brown haze, that pollution is now gone. So again, it's nice and clear. This is sitting up at the top of Masonic. Look at, look at how pretty the valley is. You can even see the Coyote Hills off in the distance. Look past the soccer field. You see Coyote Hills, you see the bay, mountains on the other side. You can even see Guy Emanuel, the roof right there. Again, this is up at the top with the big tree. All right, but some of our pollutants that can come through, again, emissions from different um, companies or corporations that are working their plants and factories. So we keep an eye on that with regulations. And, but one thing we have extra that we can't control are those wildfires. And you guys with your big Santa Ana winds, um, those can be very difficult, but what kind of pollutants do those put in the air? Okay, and if you remember, um, this was when some of the big fires were starting up. And I think that they made you guys have your days where you couldn't go outside or if you had respiratory problems, I think you had to stay inside or that you couldn't go out for PE, things like that. Because eventually, this is how bad it got. 
So November last year, the, or 2019, um, the forest fires were, blow, the wind was blowing down this way and it was just socked in the valley. Okay, look, you can't even see <laughs> down at the bottom um, where we were just talking about. You can't even see Guy Manuel or even see the bottom of the yurt down there. All right, so then again, makes your eyes burn, um, hard to breathe, can burn your throat. So again, lots of issues with our air quality. But everywhere we looked, we were socked in. But the doesn't stay for too long because then the winds catch up again. So again, you guys have those big Santa Ana winds that unfortunately fuel the fires, but it also carries those smokes farther away. So a lot of times even smoke, if you've got um, smoke in one state, it's gonna flow two or three states over, okay? Years ago when Mount, um, was it Shasta? When we had, you guys had the volcanic uh, eruption, I had the ash way over in North Carolina. Okay, so again, these wind currents, you see the, here's um, United States right here. And look at, see how there's, there's a wind pattern that's kind of swirling up around Alaska off of the California coast. And again, these wind currents will change, but they help carry those pollutants around. All right, so trying to fix some of these problems, we are working on that restoration so the biological activity, we got to get those little um, microbes back in the soil. We got to get things healthy again. So if you look at the difference between the natural ecosystem and then the urban environment, big thing that's missing, trees, right? We don't have the trees to filter our air. Um, you're going to get more erosion from the wind taking that topsoil. And again, we get more pollutants from the machinery, other activities. So the topsoil is again, what has all those nutrients. And that's why we're doing that program with um, the food waste at Masonic. So as we build up that top layer, the O horizon level, uh, we will be able to get healthier plants in there. Now, what happens though, when we don't look at the urban side. So if you don't take care of the topsoil, then the plants can't really grow. There are not enough nutrients. They end up having to add fertilizers, add chemicals to the land to get the plants to grow. Well, if they add too much, then it just leaches or it washes out. It washes away, washes away into your water, your storm water. Okay, so you still end up with a pollution problem. Um, you end up with soil that's then contaminated. Okay, so again, lots of different um, issues. Without, when that soil is disturbed, then it's no longer able to hold on to that carbon dioxide. So it's no longer a carbon bank either. So that's then released into the atmosphere. All right. So again, we are trying to create some nutrient rich soil. And you can look again across, we still see the coyote hills there. So these trees that were planted there around the yurt, around that little round circle, those have been there for about 15 years. So now we've got about 60 smaller trees up top and one big tree, uh, a couple other plateaus also planted. So hopefully we will get you guys up there soon and you can do some planting as well. All right, um, look around your own environment though. Notice those treasure trees that we have, those legacy trees. Notice the trees in your area that are old, that are huge, that have been there and try to protect those. Because again, those play an important role in cleaning our air, um, regulating temperature. Okay, so sustaining our environment. So those are some of the things you can do is, again, look for the treasure trees, try to save things like that. Um, make sure we've got enough food and space for organisms. Take care of the air, uh, land and water. Don't waste your water. Keep in mind your pollutants. It's best to wash your car like at a car wash, not regular where it's gonna go down the storm drain. Um, so as you look at this picture, again, we need a lot of the humus or the organic matter to be able to have those um, microbes that you guys studied last time that we did a lesson to look that will help with the decomposition. All right. So there's lots of stuff you guys can do. <laughs> and we're going to get back into um, some things you can do here in a minute. So looking to see if your environment is healthy. Would you say that your environment here is pretty healthy? looking around, we do have a lot of animals that survive in our urban world, 
right? We have a lot of animals up there on the hills, but we do have some that are able to adapt and live here with us. So this is showing you a food web of an owl. So the owl eats lots of different types of foods. And that tells me as a wildlife biologist how healthy the environment is. If something like my top predator can find enough food, then I know that there's um, enough resources around. Okay. If some part of that food chain starts to break down, then yeah, I got to start looking and we have a, an issue we have to deal with. All right. So this is my story though, that I want you guys to listen to flight of the raptors. And it's about the raptors at the California nursery historical park. And that's where we grow a lot of our trees um, for going up to Masonic. But unfortunately right now it is also under some construction. So most of it is closed off, but hopefully we will get it back up and be doing our um, hoot owl trips and all. So anyway, listen to this little story. Flight of the Raptors at California Nursery Historical Park by Sahithi Adiraju, animated by Hagos Tavolti. Hundreds of years ago, in the East Bay Hill, San Francisco Bay Area, large raptors, including eagles, osprey, hawks, kites, and owls, would soar in the wind currents along the mountains. The birds would look for prey in the Diablo Range and fish in the running rivers of what is now called Alameda Creek. The native Ohlone's respected and honored the large birds as signs of strength and beauty for over 2,000 years. In the late 1700s, as Spanish missionaries, ranchos, and settlers moved into the area, they unfortunately destroyed much of the raptor habitat. As the population of the Ohlone's dwindled due to disease and mistreatment from the immigrants, so did the raptors. No one was left to preserve the natural habitat. How would future generations understand the importance of raptors in keeping nature in balance? Education through schools, nature tours, museums, and even signs can help in their understanding. This is a story of a journey of two young children who decided to learn about the raptor habitat and to help educate the community to save and restore their habitat. John and Eliza were neighbors who were in the same class at a local elementary school. In science, they were learning about the environment and the importance of preserving habitat for top predators of the food web. Their teacher asked them to think about what it would require for large birds to live in this area. Think of an owl. What animals would they need to eat to survive? The teacher continued, how can you find out what they eat? Owls eat their prey whole and then belch up what is called an owl pellet. You can look at the bones and figure out what they ate. Wildlife biologists can trace what the owls ate and can even tell how old an animal was when it was caught. The teacher challenged the students to find out if there were owls in the local area. John and Eliza discussed this as they were walking home. John asked, Have you ever seen an owl in the area? Eliza had to think about it and finally said, No, I do not even know if I would recognize one. They both went home and looked on the internet to see pictures and videos of owls in the area. They were amazed that the great horned owl and barn owl lived in their neighborhood. They learned that other birds of prey, like hawks, kites, and ospreys, were also present. They decided to meet and explore a nearby park called the California Nursery Historical Park. The nursery used to sell a variety of trees, shrubs, and flowers to the entire west coast of North America. There are even large trees in the area over 150 years old. While walking toward the park, the students heard a disconcerting shriek from within the park. They looked at one another, concerned about the origins of the sound. Bravely, 
they decided to enter the park to solve the mystery of the sound. Suddenly, they heard another piercing cry. They looked up to the sky, and there was a red-tailed hawk. It was majestically soaring through the sky, looking for prey. Since their eyes are eight times more magnified than ours, they can easily see the ground below, no matter how high they fly. California Nursery has plenty of tall palm trees, which are potential perches that provide good views. The nursery's open areas provide a good home for mice and squirrel, which are the bulk of what the hawk eats. Suddenly, the hawk plunged and caught a ground squirrel with its feet. It used its sharp talons to grab the prey and flew to a tree branch. It began to eat the prey by using its beak to tear the flesh. Meanwhile, they saw a flash of white. It was another raptor. This time, it had black shoulder patches, a long white tail, and a hooked beak. Eliza identified this as a white-tailed kite and asked, Hmm, why is it called a kite? They got their answer when the kite started to hoover over the grass like a child's kite. It flapped its wings and stayed in the same position, waiting for prey below. This behavior is called kiting. Just like the hawk, the kite plunged to the ground. It caught a gopher by its talons and moved to another tree to eat. While observing the raptors, the children notice a mysterious object near the base of the palm tree. It seemed to be a mixture of bones and something else, maybe fur. Using their magnifying glass, they saw bones and identified some ribs and claws. They resembled human skeletons, except they were much tinier. Was this an owl pellet their science teacher told them about? Eliza remembered their teacher explained that it came from an owl's burp. The students were astonished. They wanted to explore the owl pellet. They had brought some forceps so they could pull it apart. They separated the fur and then they found tiny bones and teeth. They were so excited they spent almost an hour finding bones of the owl's meal. An owl's stomach has two parts, the glandular and muscular. The glandular stomach works like ours with the digestive enzymes that help break down food. The muscular stomach, commonly called the gizzard, acts as a filter which holds the fur and bones as the owl cannot use those for nutrients. When the gizzard is full of this ingestible material, it squeezes it all together forming an owl pellet which is discharged through the owl's throat. Owls are nocturnal meaning they sleep during the day and wake up in the night. Other raptors, like hawks and kites, are diurnal, sleeping during the night. John and Eliza decided to return at sunset. The great horned owl is found at the California Nursery Historical Park. This owl has tufts of feathers on its head that look like horns. This owl looks very wise with its big, bright yellow eyes. Great horned owls are also fierce hunters. Their wings, wingspan can be up to five feet long. They sometimes eat other raptors like hawks. Great horned owls are best known for their amazing vision. Their pupils open wide during the dark, allowing them to see their surroundings more clearly. They cannot move their eyes side to side, but instead can turn their heads 180 degrees to look at something behind them. Great horned owls have a distinct hoot. The barn owl also lives at the California Nursery Historical Park. Their name is derived from the many barns they can be found in. At California Nursery, they live in the tall palm trees and sleep there during the day. They have a heart-shaped face and white feathers. 
Their flight is quiet because they have these downy feathers along their wings that insulate their sounds. These super soft feathers allow barn owls to sneak up on their prey. Barn owls have long legs and talons to catch their prey easily. Barn owls are best known for their excellent hearing. They can catch prey that are completely covered by shrubs or grass. This hearing comes from the heart-shaped disc which focuses and traps sounds. Their ears aren't symmetrical like our ears. One ear is higher than the other. The bottom ear captures the sound from the ground while the upper ear focuses on sound from the sky. John and Eliza went to California Nursery Historical Park at sunset with one of their parents. They walked around and were quiet to see if any of the owls would show up. Sure enough, they heard a high-pitched sound like someone was hurt. Don't be scared of the screech. That is the sound of the barn owl, John exclaimed. Barn owl's calls are not what you think an owl sounds like. They screech instead of hoot. There were three barn owls on a high branch. One looked smaller than the other two. It could have been a juvenile learning how to find prey from its parents. The light within the park outlined the white face of the barn owls. A few minutes later, they saw the silhouette of two larger owls. It looked like it had horns, so it must be the great horned owl. It was so much larger than the barn owls. They were perched on a big limb and looked so majestic. They heard us and the owls flew off looking for prey. What a sight and what a night. Will the owls remain at California Nursery's historical park? Both John and Eliza wonder. Eliza's father put in a word of caution. Their populations are stable compared to other birds, but their habitat is reducing. This is mainly due to building homes for people and not understanding the needs of the birds. All of Fremont used to be grasslands and open spaces where they can live. California Nursery Historical Park in the surrounding hills of the East Bay provides a safe haven for these owls and other raptors. Reforestation of some of the hills will also increase their population as trees provide habitat for our raptors. John and Eliza decided they would advocate for the park and started their own tours of the trees that needed to be taken care of. They learned how to monitor the owls by taking notes of their occurrences and determine if there were any problems in the owl population. They would talk to their classmates and anyone who would listen. All right, so even though they were kids, they decided there was something that they could do um, to get people's attention and educate them about the owls. Now, all of the raptors, the owls, the hawks, even the vultures, those are all animals that are federally protected. So you can't even own a feather without a federal permit. Um, but as you are walking around, even in the towns of Union City and, and Fremont here, if you see a large tree, kind of look down at the base and you might see something that looks like this. And this is that little pellet. So this is a small pellet from a barn owl. It's smaller. So again, it's made in its stomach. It just kind of bundles up all of this bone and the fur that it can't use. A larger one like this would be from the great horned. Okay, so again, I can already see that it's got some things in it, some, some bones and all in it. Now, remember from the video that the owl, some of it, the nutrition does go through its digestive system. So it does kind of pee and poop all at the same time, a white substance kind of called a uric acid. Um, but as you peel this um, owl pellet apart, this is kind of what you get. So as you're peeling apart the fur, like it starts to kind of fluff up, you end up being able to find little teeny bones. And then you have to try to figure out, ah, that's a bottom jaw. Yep, there you go, I think you guys can see it. Okay, so then you can compare to your chart that you have. This again is something that your teacher can run off for you. There's a picture of both the barn and the great horned. 
And inside we have the skeletal drawing of a vole that also similar to the uh, ground squirrels, the gophers, th things like that. But you can identify them from the shapes of their skulls. Now, as a wildlife biologist, I can also tell if it's an immature animal or an older one. Um, your bones, <laughs> when you are young, this little part at the top, this little cap, when like you guys your age, that still has some cartilage there. It's not all the way cemented yet. So this is an adult, okay? But if this was an immature, this little piece of cartilage, the owl has enough stomach acid that it would break off that little piece. Um, so again, that's how I can tell if they're eating immature or adult. And that's gonna give me an idea of the population of the prey as well as the predator. Okay, because it all kind of goes together. So again, this is probably um, two pellets that have been fluffed up. So this is something again that you could easily do with like your document or scanner or just like your camera mounted and you guys can do your investigation. All right, so I've got my little eagle here to remind me, um, even up at Masonic because we've got more trees, uh, better habitat going. We now have our golden eagles and we have even seen some bald eagles up there. So again, improving the habitat, again, getting more organisms coming in. All right, so here is just a little blip about the owl pellet. I think I just told you everything um, that you needed there. Again, you've got the pellets. So teachers, I need you just to send me an email either at that um, davidson at msnucleus.org 